Whilst you were tucking into your Easter eggs and hot cross buns at the weekend, Rishi Sunak was having to digest the devastating results of a mega poll, which shows that the Tory party is on course to not just lose the forthcoming general election, but get a thorough trouncing. Could the most successful election winning machine in Western Europe really be heading towards oblivion? Welcome to the Downtown Den Politics Podcast. Uh, my friends sort of used to run through the fields of wheat. Uh, you turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Uh, they will, it will cost. Um, I know words, I have the best words, but there's no better word than stupid. Okay, so welcome back to the Downtown Den Politics podcast. Uh, This episode, no Jim Hancock, I'm afraid he's away, sunning himself on the continent, no doubt in his speedos, Uh, but we hope to welcome Jim back next week. I am delighted to be joined by Naomi Smith. Naomi is the chief executive of Best for Britain. I should declare an interest at this stage. I recently became a director of this fantastic organisation. And before we get into this poll, which Best for Britain commissioned, of course, Naomi, tell listeners what the organisation does. Yeah, thank, well, thanks so much for having me on, Frank. Um, I'm not wearing Speedos, uh, so I didn't know that, that was maybe the uniform. <laughs> give, me a, give me a heads up next time and I'll see what I can do. Um, so, yeah, I, I run Best for Britain um, and we are a campaign to fix the problems that Britain faces after Brexit. So we were originally set up to try and stop Brexit. Uh, We weren't weren't too successful on that front. Um, But since then, what we've really tried to do is to galvanize the business community with parliamentarians from every party uh, that is represented at Westminster and ordinary voters to not just talk about the problems, but the solutions, how can we fix it? the, the Johnson Brexit deal hasn't delivered for businesses, it hasn't delivered for voters. Some of that is probably playing out in the poll that no doubt we're going to talk about. Um, but but what we are in the game of doing is saying, all right, we probably can't rejoin the EU and certainly not for a, a very long time. But that doesn't mean we can't start fixing all of those problems now. So what are the practical solutions that this government or the next government could be implementing to bring costs down, make life better for everybody in the UK and across Europe? Mm. And Naomi, when you sort of reflect back on those times of immediately after the poll, which was so close, let's mm-hmm. remind people, it was 52-48. It wasn't as if there was a mass movement of people looking to uh, have a hard Brexit, if I can put it that way. Uh, are you surprised at where we've ended up? Did you expect a government of whatever colour? to put together a deal that would at least enable business you've referenced to be able to trade efficiently and effectively? You're dead right when you say, Frank, that 52-48 feels much more like what people sometimes refer to as a soft Brexit. And I think that would have been a much fairer reflection of how the country voted back in 2016. But what may try to do, Theresa May, remember her many, many prime ministers ago now, even though it's not actually that many years, um, she was trying to negotiate a much softer deal than the one that Johnson then actually delivered. But she was thwarted by trying to get that through Parliament, um, not least because of the efforts of organisations like Best for Britain, People's Vote Campaign, European Movement, the Liberal Democrats, the SNP, Plaid Cymru, many, many, many Labour MPs who were saying, no, 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 we need to have a second referendum because it, the, the first one should have been an advisory one, not a binding one. And what we should do is put to the vote, now we know what a deal looks like, do you want it or not, rather than do you vaguely want us to leave or, or, or stay in? And no one ever really knew what leave meant, least of all the leavers, because yeah. all the different leave groups had different interpretations of what Brexit meant. You know, yeah, some of them like Daniel Hannan, who was a Conservative MEP, he was saying, oh, we'll stay in the single market, we'll stay in the customs union. Yeah. And then you had, you know, the much more hardcore Brexiters like Nigel Farage and his ilk, who were saying, no, 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 we should default to WTO trading rules. We shouldn't have any kind of uh, bespoke deal whatsoever with Europe. But because of Theresa May's um, 
a minority administration. She she couldn't she couldn't do anything. She couldn't get anything through. So her government collapses. And then, as you say, Johnson comes in with his 80 seat majority back in late 2019 off the back of his. Do you remember the phrase oven ready deal, <laughs> which was half baked at bloody best and at worst was still frozen to the core in the middle and, and delivered something that really does not reflect what voters wanted, what is good for the economy, what businesses need to you know, grow and flourish. And, you know, look, we've had terribly stagnant growth. You'll know this. Your listeners will know this. All of your contacts at downtown business will tell you that their wings have been clipped by this deal. They simply cannot grow their businesses in the way they could have done if we'd had a, a softer version or no Brexit at all. And do you think, Naomi, that the political parties, at least the Liberal Democrats, Labour, are looking at European policy going into the next general election with a view that we can improve things? Because, as you say, Best of Britain have come up with not just the problems that Brexit has caused, but also some of the solutions. What are parliamentarians saying to you as far as our future relationship with the EU is concerned? Well, I mean, I have to be slightly careful not to reveal, you know, things that are said to me in confidence. However, I think it's broadly very encouraging. So when we were developing our policy solutions, we we did over 100 of them because we did the, the most comprehensive consultation of business post Brexit that had ever been done, um, and we did that with a with a panel, a commission of of um, experts from business and parliamentarians from every party in Westminster. We had the DUP involved, we had Conservatives involved, as well as Green, Plaid, SNP, Labour, Lib Dem, and so it was a cross party effort to come up with those solutions. So just purely on that basis, you'd hope that none of them was unpalatable or controversial to the vast majority of patriotic party politicians that want the best for our economy and our country. Since then, we've had two um, or three, I think, shadow cabinet members um, say this policy is something that we will seek to do if we form the next government. So we've had um, Nick Thomas-Simmons, who was... Uh, shadow trade and is now shadow um, minister without portfolio but with the Brexit brief he said yeah we we should have an independent board of trade not one that's uh, appointed by the secretary of state and their cronies to kind of rubber stamp anything the government comes up with but a truly independent body of business representatives to say you know actually yeah Uh, Let's analyse the impact of a New Zealand trade deal on Welsh hill farmers. Let's analyse what's actually going to be the impact of doing uh, a deal with Indo-Pacific countries. Will that actually flood our market with cheap imports that make domestic export much harder or or will it help? So um, we we know that Labour are are pretty committed on that front. And then the, the headline one, the main one, if there's sort of one thing that business tells us we really, really need. It's it's called beneficial alignment. So what's that basically saying is the UK should align wherever possible, wherever it's beneficial with standards, protections and regulations that the EU comes up with. Why? Because they are our nearest and largest trading partner. And it just makes sense not to diverge from the, the standards that they set so that we can much more seamlessly trade with one another. And we've had lots of, of Labour politicians, but you know certainly David Lammy, who's Shadow Foreign Secretary, um, but also uh, Johnny Reynolds, who's the Secretary of, well, Shadow Secretary of State for whatever it's called now, DBAT, Department for Business and Trade, <laughs> um, uh, and others saying, yeah, you know, alignment seems to be uh, the, the most sensible option. When you look at Liberal Democrat policy, uh, so their conference decides policy and, and votes on it and passes it. They they have a kind of re uh, rejo- a path to rejoining the customs union and single market as part of their policy offering. Um, I don't know the detail of it, but certainly it's a, it's at its heart a very pro European party that I think will want to reinforce anything that that Labour tries to do in terms of getting a closer relationship with Europe. But at the moment, you know, then none of the big parties are talking about rejoining. Um, but they are talking about strengthening and deepening that relationship for, for mutual benefit on both sides of the channel. 
Yeah, it sounds like a, a very common sense approach, but common sense is something that's been rather lacking in this <laughs> parliament, I would suggest. And uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why this poll that Best for Britain commissioned and um, was uh, published over the weekend, got the front page of the Sunday Times, but featured in many other media outlets as well, shows such a devastating result for the Conservatives. So uh, tell people about how this Polls commissioned initially yeah. and why it's such an important and different type of poll to those others that we see released during the course of the year. Sure. Um, so when when you hear about, um, oh, you know, 78 percent of people think that uh, the media should leave the royal family alone. Right. Or, or whatever the news story is, that's usually a poll of about 1800 to 2000 people. Now, that is nationally representative. There is nothing wrong with that kind of poll. But if you want to look at. A very accurate. Prediction for if an election was held today, what would actually happen in every single constituency in GB? So we don't do Northern Ireland, so it's not the full 650 seats. It's. Um, it's it's sort of closer to 630. You have to do something called MRP, and that is now the gold standard analysis of predicting outcomes. And usually, it's used for predicting election outcomes. Um, MRP stands for multi-level regression and post-stratification analysis. I will not test you on that later, Frank, because I like you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> and it's a tongue twister. But what but what I will do is just try and explain what that is for, for, yeah. for listeners that don't understand. So what you do is you take a much bigger poll than say an 18, 000, uh, 1800, 2000 person poll. You need at least sort of 10,000 odd people uh, to be responding to it. So you've got this really nice chunky sample. We actually went up to 15,000 with this one and we oversampled some constituencies where we were not entirely sure that we picked up the exact vibe of what was happening. And then what the, the very clever data scientists do is they add in thousands of other rows of data and that will come from the census, Office of National Statistics and other information. And you end up with thousands of rows of data. And what you can then do from that is infer a probability based on a characteristic. So you could say a man in his 40s living in Liverpool who's got a university degree has got a 60% chance of voting Labour. And then what you do is you stratify and you go, how many people who look like him live within the constituency of Liverpool Walton, say? And then from that, you can determine how likely that seat is to go Labour or any other party. And by doing that across the whole country, you can not only say, oh, the, the Conservatives are on 25 percent and Labour's on 40 percent. You can literally say in each constituency and therefore the, the winner on the day, if, if, if the election was held today, would be the Conservatives or the Greens or the Lib Dems or whatever. And what this poll has done is put, for the first time that we've asked this question, has put the Conservatives on fewer than 100 seats if there had been an election held on the day the poll was done. And that's really quite shocking. You would have to go back to probably the Civil War to find that few Conservative MPs in England. I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite... Uh, devastating. What I would say is this is a poll. It's not a prediction. Mm. It's not a forecast. Anything could happen. Mm. But if there had been an election held on the day the poll was done, it looked like the Conservatives would fall below 100 seats. And that in itself is, is really quite remarkable. Mm. It is. It's an absolutely devastating poll. It gives Labour, I think, a poll lead of uh, over 20 percent. But the real story, I suppose, was the spike in reform support because it's the reform party that appears to be taking votes away from the Tories and of course the poll shows that in seven constituencies reform would actually finish in second place. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, now, we had seen reform climbing a bit over the last year in polls, but this one, it, I mean, whether it's the Lee Anderson effect and just the sheer amount of press coverage that the party's now getting that it didn't get before, but it has soared against the Conservatives. And as you say, coming second now in, in seven seats, they are all in England. Um, but, they're, you know, they're kind of spread out across the country. They're not all concentrated in sort of one very pro-Brexit part of the country mm. in the East Coast or anything like that, although some of them are there. And our message from this, but what, what we took from it was Sunak's in real trouble. And not only, you know, as a, as a leader, but even in his own constituency, he's only leading the Labour candidate by 2%. Uh, 2.5%. Um, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, in his new constituency of Godall, Ming and Ash, he's only 1% ahead of the Liberal Democrats challenging him there. And then when you think about, OK, well, if, if this poll is so devastating for the Conservatives, will they be thinking about ditching him? There are enormous numbers of rumours around. I saw a, an article yesterday, uh, we're, we're recording this on, on Wednesday, so it was on Tuesday, I saw a an article saying that Grant Shapps has been getting his leadership team together. And of course, we know that Kemi Badenoch and others all, all have their eye on the prize. But it's not obvious that any of them is going to be safe enough in their seat to effectively challenge him. So Penny Morden is probably the, the bookie's favourite and the, the party favourite after her, uh, you know, wonderful moment with the sword. Um, <laughs> it's kind of emblazoned on everybody's mind. Um, <laughs> but she she definitely, you know, is looking very precarious in her Portsmouth North seat. On our poll, she's losing it to Labour. Kemi Badenoch's probably the, the runner and rider with the most comfortable margin. She's got about 7.5% lead, I think, over her nearest challenger. So, so the Conservatives are in a pickle. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens after the local elections in May as to whether there is a, a very serious move against Sunak. Because with this poll, combined with you know what is almost certainly going to be a bad day for the Tories uh, on local election day, um, they'll be incredibly tempted to, to try and get rid of him. And if they do try, it could be that he calls an earlier general election um, than than the the one predicted for the autumn. Yeah, stick or twist will be the decision yeah. for the Tories, I suppose. The problem they have, I think, Naomi, is that you've got no obvious candidate, have you, alternative candidate? When Theresa May fell on us, or Boris Johnson had this momentum, had a big wave of support, was a very well known personality out in the country as well. And although, you know, political anarchs like you and I will know all of those names that you've mentioned, they wouldn't get that recognition if you went no. and polled people in constituencies. And again, I think I'm right in saying that a series of polls now have shown that actually, if they change leader, the support would go down. I think the only one that sort of sees a slight sort of hike in support for the Tories is actually Penny Morden. So it, it's not going to be the silver bullet that some Conservative MPs think, is it? Changing? No, leader. no, it isn't. And while they are having their, you know, internal warfare and power struggles, the country is mm. going to the ground. I mean, you know, Frank, I'm coming up to the northwest next month i cannot get a train at any time of day return for less than like 150 quid mm -hmm. you know and that's if it runs yes. um <laughs> yeah. you know we can't get to see our gps we're on waiting lists for medical appointments and nhs appointments that get pushed back and back and back we can't get to see dentists you know nothing is working and there is this real sense of frustration and anger towards this party that have been overseeing all of this for 14 years mm. and yet are more bothered about their own internal power struggles and ever more ludicrous um you know statements about stopping the boats when they haven't stopped any of them um and their Rwanda plan and they haven't managed to get a flight to take off you know which is all part of their own internal power struggle it's you know this is what the red meat that I can throw to my party base wants so I'm just going to keep doing more of that and and real ordinary people 
who are struggling to pay their food bills, their energy bills, to get their kids into a, a school that isn't falling down because the concrete has crumbled, mm. you know, who are having to look after aging parents and, you know, raise a family and go out and work and all of that at a time when the government just seemed to be more bothered about internal infighting. It is absolutely maddening. We need a general election. It's overdue. They've, they've, you know, had more than enough chance to try and do the right thing for the country. They keep, seem to keep doubling down and doing what's worst for it. And so I think the point from this poll is that this is a, a poll showing huge appetite for change. And it's not to my mind, because the focus groups don't suggest that it is. I don't think it's a pull factor towards Labour. It is a push factor away from the Conservatives. Yeah, and was... as yet, I don't think there are many people that are really excited about a Labour government. Mm. They're just done with this one, completely mm. done. Yeah, that was the next point I was coming to. It's a great segue into my question there, Naomi. Um, because there doesn't appear, as you rightly say, this enthusiasm for Keir Starmer and a Labour government. It doesn't feel like 1997, does it, when Blair swept to power with that landslide? And there was a real excitement in the country at that time that this meant genuine change. And I guess some of that is because of Labour's caution around things like the EU, but many other policies as well. Um, but interestingly, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that people out in the country didn't want a hard Brexit, but here we are this morning, uh, mentioning the fact that reform have seen a hike in its support. And that is, I guess, from people who do think that we need a harder Brexit or a hard Brexit. Um, it's a mixed message, a, a mixed bag of, of polling results that, because in one sense, you would say, well, for progressives, this is really good news because Labour are way ahead. But on the other hand, you know, the fact that it's reform that are dragging the Tory results down does give me at least some cause for concern about the sort of medium to long-term impact of where our politics yeah. are going. Yeah I, I completely agree with you Frank and that, that is my concern too as somebody who would self-define as being on the centre-left of, of British politics. Um, I think the it's often called the Overton window you know it's the it, where is the middle ground because the, yeah. the problem with calling yourself a centrist is that you're defined by where mm. left and right are and they're, they're always moving. And yeah. I think we are seeing a drag in many Western democracies. This is not a UK only problem further and further and further to the right. Mm. So you've got a situation where, and to, to use a, a, a phrase, and you mentioned Blair in 97, to use, use a phrase from that era, triangulation, mm. you, you've often got uh, policy triangulation to, to try and get people on the left and the right to coalesce around your position on something. That effect, plus, as you say, Labour not yet setting out their big vision for the country. You know, what does the UK under Prime Minister Starmer look like? Now, I think that will come when an election is called. If it doesn't, that will be incredibly disappointing. But let's assume that that does come and people can begin to see what that will look like. Um, and 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 say they do win, but at the moment, Labour are, are worrying about those red wall seats, the ones that flipped away from Labour towards the Conservatives at the last election. They they wanted to be very very cautious to not give those people reason to go back to the Conservatives or further still over to Reform UK. So they're sort of not pitching their tent on the centre left too openly there, and you've got the internal battles within the Conservatives being very much driven by Reform UK agenda and, and panic about that, meaning that they're going to have to shift further to the right. And then post-election, say this poll was to come true and you've got the Tories on less than 100 seats and you've got a, a very big majority for Labour, what do the Liberal Democrats do? Do they do what they did under Charles Kennedy in the noughties when you had the Blair and Brown governments and try and, uh, I don't mean attack in the horrible sense mm. of the word, but, you know, criticise mm. Labour from yeah. the left, mm. or do they seek to fill the vacuum that is going to be vacated by the Tories losing so many seats mm. by saying, OK, well, we're now the, the, the party of the shires and mm. the southeast wealthy constituencies of, you know, the, the London hinterlands. 
in which case they too would feel the need to shift to the, the right. And, and I think there is a danger for the Liberal Democrats that that is the space that they choose to occupy by virtue of the kinds of seats that they're likely to win. Whereas in the noughties, when they were winning 50, 60 seats at a general election, they were dispersed all over the country. There are lots in Scotland, Wales, the north of England, southwest, as well as some in the southeast. So they were, you know, a much more small level liberal uh, counterweight on on um, some of the things that, that Blair and Brown were doing. So I do worry that we're seeing a, a, a gradual shift ever ever further right. But my hope is, and you've always got to stay hopeful, is that with organisations like yours and mine calling on the government of the day to be sensible, to do the right thing, with a large majority, they'll feel that they can do those things safely um, and that they're not, you know, in a hung parliament situation or a minority administration where they've kind of got to keep everybody happy, including the right, that we, we will see a bold, progressive government uh, with a nice, healthy majority. Well, let's hope so. We will uh, find out sooner or later, I suppose. But the final thing I'll ask you as far as the poll is concerned, great comfort to the Tories in recent months has been the number of people who said don't know when asked the question, who are you going to vote for? Again, uh, very uh, noticeable, the poll that you undertook. Those don't knows were not as big in number, were they? No. And what, what we've done... Um previously is we have allowed people to answer don't know uh, in a survey and then we've interrogated those don't knows and said yeah but go on yeah but go on if you if you had to if you had to and we've looked at all of their characteristics and you know what is their age profile what is their home ownership profile do they rent do they own outright do they own with a mortgage what's their education level and previously we found that about 75 percent of people saying don't know mapped exactly to the profile of a current conservative voter so we were we were quite concerned that there, there were a lot of sort of shy conservative votes within yeah. those don't knows yeah. that come polling day when you can't put don't know mm. we could spoil your ballot but that they would they would fall in line to support the conservatives on this poll we thought no no let's run it like it was actually a general election and we won't give people that option um and that's the one that we released but we did do a poll we haven't yet released so we do know what the don't know numbers are so we sort of ran to at the same time and interestingly what seems to have happened between the last time this is an exclusive you're getting here from by the way and <laughs> um, the difference between the last time we did don't know and this time is that um it seems to be that they're about 50 50 labor tory um so i think that some of those shy Tories are now not shy anymore and they're showing up in Tory numbers or they flip to Reform UK um, and the remaining don't knows are sort of genuinely undecided voters that are like well I'm a bit of a swing voter I don't yet know what Starmer's really offering me I don't know that the Tories aren't gonna you know come out with some really nice tax cut that I'm gonna you know benefit from so I'm I'm a genuine don't know for now and then when we push them they sort of seem to split relatively evenly between Labour and the Tories. Fascinating. Well, Naomi, it's been lovely to talk to you this morning. If people want to know a bit more about Best of Britain. Where do they need to go? Bestofbritain.org. It's all there. And you can sign up for free if you go to bestofbritain.org slash join. A great, great organisation with some fantastic directors and, of course, a super <laughs> executive as well. And Naomi is joining us for a very special roundtable event in Manchester later in April. Um, I'm afraid it's invitation only. Um, but uh, if you're interested, if you're really, really interested, in come along and drop me a line. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and we'll try and sneak you in. It's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a great, uh, a great discussion, I'm sure. Naomi, thanks for joining us today and see you later in the month, if not before. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers, Naomi. And that's been the Downtown Den Politics podcast this week. A little shorter than usual. Not Jim Hancock, as I say, to waffle on uh, relentlessly about how fantastic the Liberal Democrats are. As I say, he'll be sunning himself wherever he is. And uh, we look forward to welcoming him back next week. Uh, but for now, uh, thanks for joining us. Enjoy, if you're still on an Easter break, the rest of your holiday. If you're back in work, then at least you've got the the comfort of the Downtown Den Politics podcast to keep you company on your dog walk, in the gym, or whatever else you're doing whilst you're listening to this. I'll speak to you again very soon.